few years. So, welcome everybody. Feel free to obviously help yourself to more food, eat. Um, we're excited that you're here and that we're able to have this, you know, pizza for you. It looks really good. I'm going to have a piece here in a few minutes. I'm um, here to um, facilitate, to co facilitate this discussion about the Wheel of Wellness. Um, specifically as it relates to financial wellness, obviously. So we're going to talk about um, some fun stuff today. We hope that it is kind of like interactive and discussion oriented, especially with people actually in the room. So that's exciting, right? I love it. All right. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Jack Popovich back there. He's eating his pizza right now. He's a finance professor here at Columbus State Community College. And um, He's kind of the expert on the financial side of things, obviously, as a, as a finance professor. Um, I'm a social work and human services professor here, associate professor here. Um, so my uh, perspective is a little bit different um, in terms of more of the wellness side of things. So I think we make a pretty good team um, and hopefully, you know, it's an interesting topic for you. So I'm going to start off. At, well, first, I'm going to talk a little. You can see the agenda. It's on your handout, too. You've got a couple of handouts in front of you. Um, anything you want to add, Jack, before we get started? You're good? Okay. So this is pretty much the agenda today, what we're going to talk about. I'm going to cover the wellness wheel and a little bit about your money story what your relationship to money is. We hope you at least start thinking about that today. Um, we're gonna talk about the cycle of financial illiteracy or hopefully literacy maybe, um, and a little bit about financial trauma, but we're gonna focus on the difference between situational and generational poverty and how that might affect how you view money, right? And finances. And then, um, We'll talk about goals, behaviors, habits of financial wellness, and right around here, I think that's right around when you take over, and um, Jack's going to talk about financial aid and budgeting and financial healing, and we'll talk about some tips and have a QA. and a It's going to be awesome. We have a lot to cover in an hour, right? Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the wellness field. I'm not going to spend too, too much time, um, but, you know, I teach a self-care class. I'm a social worker, obviously, I said. And social workers have high stress jobs, a lot of people do. And so considering your own wellness is really an important thing that we do in the field of social work. It's actually part of our code of ethics to take care of ourselves. So if you're interested in social work, talk to me later. It's a great field to go into. But we talk about the wellness wheel a lot because it's really important to take care of yourself in all of these aspects of who you are whether it's intellectual wellness, emotional wellness, even environmental wellness. You know, there's so many different, there's a new wellness wheel I use that even has create, creative wellness on here. Um, so we can add things, but financial wellness is a really important piece of part we're gonna consider this today. Um, but we want you to think about your wellness in all areas. And the cool thing about financial wellness is it, can, it bleeds into a lot of the other areas of wellness too. Right. So it may bleed into like it kind of overlaps. Maybe bleed is not the right thing to say because that's a bad thing. But there's an overlap with like maybe your um, occupational wellness. Right. And it's not on here, but it, it could also be like why you're in school. Right. To improve your financial circumstances, among other things. So it certainly um, can overlap with your social wellness and your intellectual wellness and things like that. So it's kind of all interrelated. Um, so we want you to start thinking about your money story. Um, and we are going to, um, throughout today, and sorry, I'm using this as an example, but, and I'm not standing where I should, of course. So let me get back on that. Um, you have a handout today, and we're going to talk about, you don't have to look at it right now, but there's some reflection questions that we're going to encourage you to look at. You could take notes on this too, if you want, or on your PowerPoint. And so um, I want you to start thinking about like what your own money story is as we're talking today. Like what kind of lessons about money did you learn from your parents? Did you learn from other important people in your life? Maybe you had friends or neighbors 
that you saw, you know, you might have had neighbors that were evicted and that there was a certain kind of, or maybe you were evicted, you know, like, so what, what kind of was the money story, job loss, that sort of thing? What were the messages you got about it? Did your family talk about those things? Were they just like not discussed, you know? Um, how were they discussed? Um, so what lessons did you learn about money growing up, you know, from all those people? Um, you know, do you have a money mentor or a person who or people who influence you? Um, you know, maybe even outside your family, or maybe it is a family member, maybe it's someone else now that maybe you're a little older and you've got other mentors in your life, right? Um, so let's look at a couple stories, shall we? <laughs> a couple of stories. So um, these are on your handout, so you can refer back to them. Um, on one side of your handout, Joshua, and I'm going to kind of organize myself here real quick so I'm not um, messing up the, the camera. So Joshua is 18 years old. He's, um, his mom is single, earns about $10,000 a year, and he's the second oldest of five children. So he works at McDonald's, drives a somewhat reliable car, and gives his paycheck to his mom, who uses it, you know, for expenses. She doesn't use a bank. She pays bills in person and uses Walmart to cash checks. Neither she or Joshua have a savings. So he's graduating from high school and wants to come here to Columbus State, right? Um, he's um, in a STEM-related major. He has to fill out the FAFSA. Um, and um, he's going to get some grant money and is eligible for loans. He'd like to move out, but doesn't know how that's going to work out with you know, his mom paying for things without his income. So what should Joshua do in this case? You know, think about that. What should Joshua do? Um, there's a little bit of room as, as we're kind of discussing these. Um, you can write some notes, jot some notes if you think, if you have a pen. I know we didn't like think to provide <laughs> writing utensils, I guess. Well, maybe some of you are students, so you should have like things with you, maybe if you're on campus. <laughs> Do people take notes anymore with a pen? I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. I was going to offer to you, I have a couple of extras. So take a second just to think like what if Joshua was your friend, right? If you put yourself in Joshua's shoes, what kind of like advice would you give him potentially? I don't know what Probably try to think about it. I mean, do we want to ask? Like actually ask? Yep. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. What would you say? Go ahead. Um, I would say he should stay home. Um, a lot of this task uh, might be eligible for home to help offset some of his expenses, like the refund. Now, I wouldn't recommend him doing that, just use his loans to pay for classes. But if he had any extra grant money, maybe he could use that for savings. Okay. Um, but I would not move out. <laughs> So stay with his mom for now, because you're fresh out of high school too, right? So when, what did you say about the loans? Like not using the loans for savings? Is that what you said? Okay. Okay, that's a good, we'll come back to that. Thank you. Right. Okay, so focus on maybe the financial aid and the, the, the um, Grants. Yes. Okay. What did you want to add to that? And we'll come around your table. Well, first of all, he worked at McDonald's. McDonald's gets I like it. They do. They have it on their commercials. Yeah, so yeah. We definitely. They make them cry. Even if you did want to move out and maybe you can stay on campus or get off campus housing, but his scholarship could possibly cover that if, you know, that is one of the things that is right. a lot. A lot of times I think, and I, this is getting into Jack's realm, but I am a parent of a freshman, so I know how that goes. Like, I think a lot of students apply for scholarships their first year, right? But even if he's missed a deadline, he could still apply for the scholarship next year, right? It doesn't always just have to be. So that's kind of a cool thing. Thank you for that.
I like that you picked up on McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, what did you want to add? Is that money he's earning can be a Okay, so maybe talk to him about opening a bank account and maybe when he's able. Uh huh. Oh, yeah. Direct sign up for direct deposit. All right, good. All right. So let's move on to Miss Sidia, who's 19. Um, her parents earn a little bit more, 40000 a year, and she's the youngest of three. She works odd jobs and um, for cash to give her parents, um, but oh wait, odd jobs for cash and her parents let her keep the money she earns. So she has $1,000 saved in a bank, but owns no car. So a little bit different than Joshua's situation. Remember he had a reliable car. She's one year out of high school, wants to start at Columbus State in the fall. She's not filled out the FAFSA. She would like to move out on her own, but not sure she can afford it. What should she do? Do you want to, you had your hand up first. You were a close I second. I do. Um, probably write a strategy, strategy plan first, um, like uh, tackle things one at a time, like first um, on like moving out. Cause like you said, like he, she doesn't own a car yet. So how can she make money to afford at least a down payment for the car? And make all like long payments yeah. in the during the time. Does she work. have to have a car though? No, not really, yeah. unless she uses the bus. Yeah, so, I mean, um, for the it's bus, nice to have a car. <laughs> Go ahead, what are you gonna say? Um, I was, yeah. <laughs> um, moving out. Um, that's like I know that's like a little uh little tough way to do. Um, <laughs> Also, like find um, cheaper places that you can rent out in, like say roommates, that sort of thing. You know, have roommates. Officer, um, you can speak also coming to CSAC and because um, I know they have like people to help out uh, when you're filing your officer. Okay. Like so, yeah. All right. Has anybody ever gotten help here with filling out FAFSA forms? I did. Yeah. Or the not form because it's not really like <laughs> uh, hard. Yeah. So that's good. 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 What did you do? Want to add anything to that? Uh, I say she should uh, get like her own, like an actual job. Okay. Because it says that she. Because she said odd jobs. Odd jobs. Yeah. Like yeah job that sounds like, like babysitting or something. Yeah. I don't know. That's not enough. Okay. So maybe get like a consistent, especially if she's going to get an apartment or something. Mm -hmm. It should be a little bit more consistent. Make more money. Okay. I like that. All right, we're just going to move forward in the, we only have an hour, although we'd love to hang out with you all day. Nathaniel's 20, his parents make $75,000 a year, and he's an only child. He saved $3,000 for family gifts and odd jobs, also with the odd jobs. Um, he's starting his second year at Columbus State in the fall. He's filled out the FAFSA, but his parents make too much money to receive any aid through it. Um, he has not been living with his parents, but is trying to budget to see if he can move out. What should he do? Friends, like, might be the singing so loud voice that that box. Oh, is this the speaker? I'm sorry, sorry. Yeah, we have a virtual audience. You can come up and talk into, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> just talk really loud. We should have a, yeah. Yeah, I'll take a shot. I'll, I'll try and repeat maybe some of what they say. Would that help? Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so um, for Nathaniel here, uh, unfortunately, his parents make too much money. Ooh, that's a tough situation. Yeah, yeah. that is tough. Um, I would definitely take the scholarship routes if he's looking to support the education or some of the resources for education, because there, there may be some scholarships that he could apply for, yeah, definitely. for as well. Um, it's great that he saved up that 3000 I could see him manipulating that a couple different ways. Like if he wants to just like, you know, invest it or keep it like stored in somewhere or maybe have some type of, uh, you know, recurring like interest on that in some location, whether that's like, uh, go ahead. You, you got, you got, oh, oh, go ahead. okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, three thousand dollars in the scheme of things when you're in college isn't. It's it's it would be great to have th for anybody to have three thousand dollars in the bank, but he doesn't know if he's going to get scholarships, right? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't work out. I wouldn't worry too much about that moving out at this point. And then the odd jobs thing came up as well, right? Again, maybe consistent stream of income 
and then yeah, I feel like it's just gonna end up eating up that three thousand to you know right. so something stable comes along. I mean, thank you. Well, let me go to her. This yeah. friend next. Go ahead. <laughs> he does have options as far as if he wants to be a um, you know an independent student, or if he can see if his parents' jobs pay for college. Oh yeah. Um, pay for your kids to go to school as well as your grandkids. So, like, if your parent works at Columbus State. That's very like you know, I work at Columbus Public Schools. And my kids can go to school. Yay. So, yeah, oh, like, it's exciting. He has options. Yeah, I might want to look into some of those creative. I like your thinking. Did you have something? And then we'll go oh. back to something else that all three of them could look into is ROTC. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. That's also <laughs> I didn't hear her. Like, ROTC might be an option, or even I'm not exactly sure all the terminology, um, but like. And, you know, just doing college through, I mean, I know they want to go to Columbus State, but you, you know, can go and serve and then come back and go to Columbus State yeah. and they'll pay for it. It'll be paid for. So did you have, well, yeah. thanks um, for being so patient. To, it's all right. Um, I just wanted to add like also something else that uh, he can do would be like finding, um, roommates are people who like uh, split like the money in half to right the rent and oh that's always like so i think for college students as well. right like, that's something to do i definitely think roommates are the way to go when you first move out anyway because then you kind of share the burden and you can i have a um a friend with a daughter right now who is living um with roommates you know and she's like the one that pays the rent and everyone gives her the money and then someone else pays the utilities, you know, and it's kind of like they split things up and they hold each other accountable. Yes, is there an issue? There is a question from the Oh yeah, audience. what's the question? The virtual audience was wondering if there, for these three students, if there's details of what they want to study at Columbus State, maybe thinking about like the job outlook, how much that pays. Yep, those are all important things. Definitely, we don't have that in our scenario, but that could all play into into that. Now, and maybe Jack will cover that a little bit more. No, he's saying no, but you know, <laughs> obviously, no, finance majors. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like one thing I know is social work. I know social workers don't make a lot of money. We all know the story of teachers and social workers and you know, some other professions that you just don't go into it for the money. I, the average social worker goes, um, earns $47,000 a year out of school. It's not a huge amount of money. It sounds good, right? Um, but it's really, if you have student loans or, you know, if you go to the Ohio State University, you can really rack it up even in social work. And we're, we tend to be a overeducated field. So a lot of social workers get their master's degrees. And then you have even more student loans and you're making like 50 grand a year. So it does get better over time. But you know, once you've been in the field for a while, but that's just one example of, um, of, uh, you know, of uh, knowing what your career path is and thinking it through, like not maybe taking out the loans. Okay, I'm going to hurry up because we're running out of time. So so thinking about, I think it's important to think about how situations impact someone, like what they want to study. Obviously, that was a great um, comment from the, um, the online folks, the Zoom, the folks on Zoom. But um, also like just the situations, like the family situation that you're coming from, how much you're working, how much you're, um, you know, having savings when you start school and all of these things. Um, so yeah, just wanting to making mistakes like taking out too many loans or, um, you know, uh, thinking that uh, they want to move, maybe moving out like such an independent like transition that a lot of people want to do, but maybe that's not the best choice. So young people can make mistakes um, that, that vary widely. Can you think of any other mistakes with money that maybe someone might make? Credit, card. credit, credit cards. cards. Oh my goodness. Yes. That's the one thing I told my daughter. I was like, 
What? Do they still do that? I don't think they can. Back, back in my day, I went to Ohio State. I remember they just, they were giving you water bottles and t-shirts to fill out an application. And then, yeah, that's a big one. Um, so that's a, hopefully this presentation is going to give you some food for thought, not just about those things, but some things you can actually do that are helpful too. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I always say that and then I do, but I promise I won't. So this can happen at any income level to any of these folks that we just, um, Joshua, Nathaniel, any of them. Um, this is just kind of a cycle of financial illiteracy that we, we have the power to break. And that's one of the reasons why we're here today. It's hard to see on your little black and white handout, but basically financial uneducated adult, financially uneducated adults, if you don't know about money, you're not going to educate your kids, right, about money. And that's not to blame anyone. That's just because there's a lot of stigma around it. There's a lot of misinformation or just we don't know what we don't know. And then obviously that affects the next generation, which could be these kiddos that are young people. I shouldn't say kiddos, I'm old. Kids that are young people we're talking about. So they become uneducated adults, right? When it comes to money, because if we don't learn from our family, who are we gonna learn this stuff from? We don't learn it in school anymore, really. So then that causes stress and maybe issues continue to escalate. And without an intervention, nothing, nothing really changes. And then there's another generation of adults that are you know, coming up that are, don't know about financial literacy. So that's the cycle we're hoping to break. Um, financial trauma can happen to anyone. I mentioned like eviction and job loss and things like that. Anytime a traumatic situation happens, mm -hmm. Um, it can relate to finances. So any, there could be a significant loss in circumstances where you know someone loses a job, needs to move to your, your socioeconomic you know, status changes to some degree. Or a divorce is a big one growing up that you know money, you know, so uh, money changes in a family. Um, and it, so it can experience a lot, you know, it can uh, influence a lot of things in the environment too. Um, losing a job, accruing debt, these are just some examples that can cause trauma. And when we experience trauma, we all have different reactions, but a lot of times we don't talk about it, right? So that can be one of the issues. I want to spend a few minutes talking about the difference between, I know I'm going through this fast, but hopefully that's okay, Jack. Um, situational and generational poverty, because trauma can happen differently in different situations to begin with, right? Um, so situational poverty is when um, something happens, maybe a trauma, a financial trauma happens. So um, I think it was Nathaniel who had the parents that were making $75,000 a year, right? So maybe because of COVID, one of the parents loses a job and it significantly decreases their income. So maybe um, eviction proceedings or foreclosure on their house starts. And that could be very traumatic, right? For the kids, maybe he's still at home at that point. That could be a trauma that he experiences. And that's going to affect his money story, right? Growing up. But then because of the support system that Nathaniel's family has, it's very situational. You know, maybe they borrow money from the family and they avoid foreclosure, let's just say, because they have the privilege of having that support system. So it was a tough situation um, because something happened, but there's, in this case, there wasn't a domino effect. They were able to like, stop the domino effect, right? So it, it could cause a domino effect, um, but, but his family remained hopeful and they knew that maybe they had some options or some resources available to them. So I'm not saying that it's still not bad if you have a situational trauma, because it can, it can really affect you over you know, your lifetime, right? A situ one situation can cause a lot, you know, a ripple effect, but it also might not. But generational poverty is when, you know, a family um, is living in poverty for more than two generations, right? Um, and so 
some of the key factors associated with generational poverty is hopelessness. And that's the big one we're gonna talk about. Um, surviving versus planning, you know? So if, if all you're witnessing growing up is survival, I mean, you're gonna learn some really important skills. You're gonna know how to survive yourself, right? If you see your parents um, or whoever is raising you really have to survive, but you're not gonna have those planning skills to think, okay, what am I gonna do with this $1,000? Or is an odd job really the way to go? If I'm surviving, it seems pretty good just to have an odd job, right? Um, and so it affects your values and the patterns that exist in your family. So all of that is part of it. So hopelessness is a big thing. Um, uh, you know, it, it's compounded in generational poverty because it can also be other types of poverty too can exist um, around, you know, in social work, we look at the whole person and the environment they live in. So if I'm experiencing poverty, but, and I also have a horrible school system situation, which happens too often, right? We all know stories about, um, you know, there might be wonderful teachers in those systems, but if they don't have the resources, if they don't have um, the ability to um, provide kind of wraparound services to students, it can really be awful. So maybe they're also experiencing educational poverty or even what we call spiritual poverty, maybe not feeling connected in that way either. Um, so it can even be more damaging and, and kind of add to that cycle of hopelessness. So it's not just being broke, right? Or not having a, an income. It's also thinking about is the, is, is the individual, you know, is it a situational poverty? Is it generational? And then what were, was the money story that kind of occurred from that? Has there been trauma to financial trauma added to that? So interesting. Any thoughts about that or questions? I know I kind of went through it quick, but Jack gave me the this signal. <laughs> and it, it made me nervous. All right. So I'm continuing. I don't know which slide I'm on now. Um, so surviving versus planning. We already kind of talked about that a little bit. Um, let's see where I am. Uh, you know, so like, and again, it's that generational poverty that might have that focus on surviving, not thinking ahead and planning. And some of you might relate to that too, right? In this very room, um, might uh, identify with that. Um, and so hopefully this will get you thinking about that as well, that there are some things that you can learn. You know, you're, you can always learn new things. You know, I believe that we're all lifelong learners and we all have the capacity to change. So just because maybe planning wasn't part of what your money story is up to this point, it can be moving forward if you want it to be. Um, so again, you know, being focused on putting food on the table, making sure that, um, you have a place to live that can if that's taking up all your energy of course you're not planning right you're just trying to make sure you get your family in a safe place and taken care of so it could be health issues it could be you know a mental health crisis in the family an addiction um so we often say that this is like crisis motivated like you're just kind of jumping from one crisis to the next and again survival skills are going to get you far in life, but you want to add to that and make sure you know how to plan as well. So um, values, your values around money, obviously, because of the money stories you're experiencing growing up, if you're um, experiencing hopelessness and generational poverty, um, might be different than a financially stable household, right? And again, it's that focus on survival. It's the focus on short-term outcomes. Um, it's not as focused on education and what that's gonna get you down the road, right? Because um, maybe you don't even have access to quality education. Um, so I think that's kind of an important piece in part. It's like, you're, it's counterproductive because you think that, you know, a lot of us have learned, and maybe that's why you're at Columbus State, that education is a way of getting out of generational poverty. But if there's not an emphasis put on education, it just kind of continues that, that cycle that we saw earlier. 
So um, yeah, that is kind of what I want you to think about. And then starting that worksheet, think about some of what you've just heard and if any of it resonates with you. Um, there's a reflection that asks you, did I see, I think I skipped the first reflection that we, <laughs> we had, did I? Okay. So think about what your goals are. If you, maybe you haven't planned, what are some goals? Like we talked about goals for the three young adults. Um, what are some goals that if you were talking about yourself, you know, or talking to um, you as a friend, like giving yourself advice, what are some goals that you have? Think about who your money mentor has been and think about someone who's got had a positive influence. And do you have a financial plan for college? Huh? Oh, did I forget to advance? Of course I did. There you go. It's also on your paper. Oh, yeah, we talked about the first reflection in the context. Sorry, I forgot. So take a second to do that. I'm going to hand things over to Jack here. You want this anywhere specific? All right. Can we do a fist bump? Oh, fist bump? Fist bump. Yeah, I got to do that. <laughs> oh, wait, you might need this. I don't know if you do it or not. have it. Is your phone? Yep, that's my phone. Thank you. <laughs> so what do you guys think? Do you, do you have someone identified as your money mentor? Right? Think about how you were raised with money. A very interesting thing we want you guys, we have some facts to give you here, but we also want you guys to start thinking about how you view money. I can tell you that when I was a kid, my parents argued about money all the time. And I just said, I don't care how much money I have. I don't care if I'm rich, poor, anything. I'm never going to argue about money this much, you know? So this, you know, learn, think about be self-reflective. I know some of you are more than others, but let's think about what you, what, how you think about money. It's really an important topic. So what do we want to do with this, with the information transfer today is general wellness is everything. It's more of the social work, kind of how Jory does the more holistic thing. And I come in more with the money specifics, right? But they're obviously both very related. Um, specific literacy, the way I defined it here, was college students to use knowledge and skills to make good decisions. So as we talked about in the leadership session today, how I influence you is really my goal today. If I can get you to think about things, learn some new things, think about them and apply them, that's a big deal. So what do we want you to accomplish during college? This might sound like a lot for a college student, but it's really important that you at least try to get to this level. So have a financial plan, feel hopeful, start creating good habits, take control of your money and control of your life. That's financial social work 101, right? It's control your money and control your life. Um, I got, I got certified in financial social work by last year, so it's kind of a fun thing. Learn how to make decisions. Graduate as close as you can to them. So I'm not going to ask who has student loans, but try to have minimal student loans if you have to have them. Use the student loan thing, not the credit card thing. And we'll talk a little bit about credit score. So now is the time to start making good financial decisions. Okay, so you, before you succeed, you have to reflect on where you're coming from, right? So I've been teaching finance a long time, and I've had a lot of facts, given a lot of facts, a lot of facts out to people, tons of information and facts and facts and facts. You got to have, it depends on how you take in those facts and how you view things, if you're going to benefit from those facts or not. Okay, so we talked about it specifically, one of the examples had an unbanked student, Okay, so if you know a bank account, it's really good to get a bank account. Um, in high school, um, if you have financial apps, you have a budget. Um, if you can get in the habit of budgeting while you're in college, there's a lot of good apps out there. I use Mint, but mm -hmm. that's, just, that's just one. There's lots of them. There's lots of good free ones out there. Mint links into your bank account, you know. Um, <laughs> I have another student that did 
think it's called why you need a budget or why you budget or something. And she told the exact story. I go into Target, I see a sweater. Do I want that sweater? Yes, it's $45. I pull up my app. Do I have $45 this month left to buy a clothing budget to buy that sweater? No, oh well, I won't get it today. Yes, okay, I do get it today. Now, she gave that example and I hope she always does that. I mean, maybe she was just, you know, put me on, I don't know. But, but that's, that's important that you can do that. So the apps are really good for that. Pay yourself first. Anyone ever heard of that besides Alex? What's that? Um, uh, <laughs> anybody? Yes. Uh, money in your savings account first. Right. You can auto deposit. You can <laughs> auto transfer every month. You can do whatever you want. Right. Uh, pay yourself first. You can put it into a retirement account if you haven't. Once you guys get your first out of college jobs out of Columbus State, hopefully you're putting some money into a retirement account, maybe some money into a regular savings account, and then the rest into your monthly checking and spending account. So financial aid is anything that helps you financially. Okay, grant scholarships, all the stuff. If you haven't filled out the FAFSA, do it. Go home and do it this afternoon. Okay. Um, I don't care how much money your parents make. I don't care if you're going to be eligible for anything. Fill it out because there's so many things. Don't have anything to do with financial situations of your family. You could have a high expected family contribution and still be eligible for things. So it's really important. But maximize your financial aid. So these are just the websites with some of the Columbus State stuff, grants and scholarships. I'm on the scholarship approval committee. One of many people that are on. Joy's are too, right? I can too, yeah. Yeah, and we have scholarships that go unused every year. No one applies. So look, at, look through those scholarships, look through those grants, okay? You may only have four out of the six criteria, but guess what? That might be more than anyone else has. So don't wait for that perfect one. Oh, you know, this is for this kind of person, this, this, this. Oh, my name's not Fred. Oh, I'm not gonna apply. No, apply anyway, okay? <laughs> if you're close, apply for it, because you might, you don't know. And do a good job filling it out. Do, write a nice little essay about why you're giving money. Get a reference, you know, if it calls for one. Do, do it well. Pardon? Spell check your essay. Spell check your essay. Yeah, I don't take too many points off for that, but yeah. Make, do a good job of it. You, might, you don't know how much you're gonna get. Um, one of the women in financial aid says that uh, when you apply for things you never know, she used an example of she got a free honeymoon for Dude. thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars just because she applied. You know? So you don't know. You might get lucky and get a lot of money. We also have good paying jobs here on campus. The next time you want to see it. Now, this came up already. Budget to borrow. Don't take out more loans than you need. When you, if you get, if you're eligible for a student loan, and I've have, have I got my doctorate only last 10 years, it looks like you can borrow, it says, oh, you're eligible to borrow $6,000. How much do you want to borrow? And it looks like you have to fill in $6,000. Guess what? You don't. You fill out less than 6,000. That's the maximum, that's the trick. Okay, and a lot of loans start accumulating interest as soon as you take them out. They're unsubsidized loans. So try not to take out any, but if you do, budget to borrow. Figure out how much you have coming in and how much you have going out. Don't borrow any more than you absolutely need to. They interview uh, the people after they graduate or finish leave college. By the way, you have to pay back your college loans when you stop going to college, whether you've graduated or not. <laughs> okay, so um, put a little more pressure to actually graduate and get a good job, but um, you got to pay it back. But every single person says, man, I wish I'd have borrowed less. You know, there's no one that says, oh, I wish I'd have borrowed 10000 more and had a higher payment every month. You know, no one says that. <laughs> All right, everyone says, I wish I borrowed less. Okay, so... Budget to borrow, minimize your loans. Budget to plan, but can you tell I like budgeting? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, most students that drop out of college is for financial needs, 
not academic. So we at Columbus State, we try to have a lot of supports, a lot of wraparound supports, as Jerry said, to help people with their money. But that's what we really need to do. I mean, people drop out of Columbus State because their car breaks down, they can't make it to class for two weeks and they flunk the class. And they say, oh, I, can't, I, can't, I can't cut it at Columbus State. It happens all the time. It's a sad situation. So try to budget. Make a one-year budget and then make a two-year plan. All right, you can't budget two years out to every dollar, of course, but have a plan on how you're going to get through the next two years, right? Do what you can. So did you guys think Alex had good answers earlier? He's in my personal finance class, you know? So take the personal finance class is a good thing. We have, a, we have an assignment for a whole bunch of points that forces you to do a budget. It forces you to do it for a longer time frame. Okay, so it is really important to think about how you're going to get through college. Those scenarios, those people don't know, they don't have a two-year plan, right? That's why I put those scenarios out there. They want to do it, but they don't know how to do it, et cetera. So it's pretty hard to make a two-year financial plan. I get it, but it's really important that you try to do this. And you want to pay yourself first, so put your savings ahead first, and then have an emergency fund again. So when your car breaks down, you have to come up with 400 bucks. Hopefully that's not going to drive you out of out of college. You got to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have to be okay. okay. I'll see you next week. Um, have that emergency fund, and then when your car breaks down, you don't have to fail your classes. Okay. Yes. Well, um, I've always heard from different financial advisors that it's not good to have a savings. It's like a and don't have too much disposable income. Well, really disposable income and savings are two different things, aren't they? I guess. Um, but I've, I've been told that, like, that, you know, it's kind of like you, you shouldn't be holding on to too much cash. <laughs> well, I mean, your cash won't, if you have $5,000 in a savings account, it's not earning any interest if that's what they need. Um, you want to have some, you want to have liquid assets. You want to have money that you can access. So you can want to invest some into an online brokerage account and try to make a little more money. That's fine. You know, cause you could, you could sell that and get that cash. If you need an emergency, have access to some money. So you don't have, you know, a disaster happen just because, you know, I, I guess I keep using car breaking down, but, um, you know, what if you're short on your rent one month or something? What if you're, you're, you get laid off at work or something? Try to put a place, something in place, have enough savings laying around or access to enough that you could pay some bills if you have a, a problem. I mean, it's, there's been studies that say, you know, people can't come up with $600. 40% you know, of Americans can't come up with $500 if they need it for an emergency or something, something like that. So I want you to have at least, you know, 500 or 1,000 bucks, not a ton, you know, Try to earn a higher return once you get past that thousand, fifteen hundred dollar range, whatever, whatever number you want to use. Maybe that's what they're talking about. Um, but no, you agree. And if your if your access is um, home equity line of credit, that's fine. You know, just have access to some cash. Yes. I think what I was taught was twenty percent of your paycheck goes to your savings. Is that what they stick with There's no rule of thumb. I mean, I would say of the. One guy uh, who I normally, I don't like most of what he says, um, Ramsey. If you just going to say Ramsey, boy. <laughs> I, I, like him, I, I like some of it, but I don't like all of it. But what I do like about him is he says, save a thousand bucks. Do what you have to do as quick as you can to get a thousand dollars in savings and then do the next thing. You know, so if you could do more than 20%, do it. My grandpa used to say, take half your savings, half your check, check and put it in the savings. And then take half of that and put it into savings. But grandpa, you know, I have to eat. <laughs> but he was from the depression. So, you know, but no, the, try to get some money so you don't have a big problem if you need some cash. Now that doesn't come into play. I mean, have some other backup plans, you know, have a backup plan if, you're, if your kid gets sick, all that kind of stuff too. That's different, I mean, that's relevant, but, you know, try to have it so you can stay in school um, if something goes a little bit awry. So that's why I love the high flex classes, right? You can come to the, you can come in the class or you can take the class from home. That way, if you're sick, your kid's sick, you can take class from home, right, man? 
Yeah, me as a whole, most of the time. You have a question? Oh, yeah, well, okay, I'm gonna ask this one question and I'll wait for the actual Q&A. But like, who do you listen to for like financial guidance that if you're not a big Ramsey fan? I would just, just lots of websites. Okay. Don't listen to any one person. For sure. There's no one guru that has all the answers. So I would just say a variety. Okay. Take, take the personal finance class. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. Which isn't listening to me. That's listening to a whole team of teachers that have built the class. So. Anyone know what a FICO score is? Or a credit score? Anyone ever heard of credit karma? Mm -hmm. Okay, 10 years ago when I used to teach these people would say, I have no idea what a, what a credit score is. Who knows what a credit score is? That's some, some weird thing. But now that we have credit card money, everyone knows what this is, which is great. Okay, You know what your credit score is. It is the, how reliable are you to pay back a loan? And it's a quantitative measurement of how reliable you are as a person to borrow money. So put yourself in the bank shoes. If you have no credit, if you have bad credit, they're going to charge you more to borrow money. You're a higher risk. Pay your bills. Keep your balances low. If we go back to this, payment history is a big part. Amount of debt is a big part. Length of credit history. So pay your bills. <laughs> keep your balances low. Apply for minimums on student loans. You try a secured credit card if you don't have any credit. That's not a bad way to go. Um, I won't get into that. We're not too good on time. Apple store cards and Apple cards are not bad. Apple will give you credit because if you don't pay, they turn off your phone. <laughs> okay, so they know they feel like you're going to pay. Um, <laughs> don't co sign for anybody. And know your credit score, credit karma. Uh, I would also add run your credit report once a year. Credit report lists all the credit that's outstanding in your name. Just Google on how to run your credit report. Question. Yes. I've had people tell me that credit karma is very accurate. Okay. Do you, do you feel like it is? Obviously. Like I know you're supposed to run your scores every year. Like you credit years. credit scores are there's three there's three companies doing your credit score officially, right? Experian. Um, TransUnion. Thank you. Equal um, bags. Yeah, and so they run your official score and they give you three different numbers for your score. If you run it, they're going to give you three different numbers. So Credit Karma tries to give an average of those three, okay. but they're not, it's not an official score technically. Okay. Credit Karma is not technically official because okay. those three, those three are the ones that officially create the scores and they officially have the algorithms and all that stuff to give you your official score. Credit Karma is probably pretty close, but it might not be a thousand percent right on. Why are the three numbers different? Because they use slightly different criteria measurements. So like when I said balances are 35% and payment history is 30, one might use 36 and 29, one might use 34 and okay. 30, that kind of stuff. That's all. And so that they do think vary the scores just slightly from each other. Okay. And it's probably good there's three, maybe two might be enough, but it's probably good they're not just one company doing it. You know, get a little different viewpoints. Uh, okay, so getting back to the mental part of it. I want you to rethink and restructure your relationship with money, unless you have bad, unless you have a great relationship already. Okay? Think about what your relationship is. Who are your money mentors? Are your money mentors rich or poor? <laughs> do you like your money? Do you like how your money mentors manage money? That is the key question, right? You like read, read Rich Dad Poor Dad. You ever read Rich Dad Poor Dad? It's an old book, but it's another good one. You know, they he had his parents he called Poor Dad because they were always always out of money and never had enough. And then his other friends were called him Rich Dad because they had a different attitude. It was just about attitude, not necessarily the money. You know, so think about what your attitude is and think about who you're who's teaching you how to think about money. Do you like how they think about money, right? I didn't like how my parents thought about money. I mean, I love my parents and all that, but, you know, I didn't like how they thought about money. Get your habits, make friends with money. Think about <laughs> Work with a new financial mentor if you're calling a success maker, right? Mm. And take personal finance. So. <laughs> a few more things. Get a bank account. Get a picture ID. 
create a two-year financial and academic plan. Well, we've talked about this college a lot about getting a financial plan for everybody. It's really hard to make that happen in reality, but we're working on it. Plan your things two years in advance. Little time tip, a three-hour class is about nine hours a week. So 12 credit hours is about a full-time job. People, especially if you're first generation, no one in your family really quite understands that. That a 12, a 12 hour load is a full-time job. It's not 12 hours, it's more like 36 hours. So take that along, pass that to your friends and family and that don't understand it. And here's some resources. And we have so much time left for questions. What, kind, what questions do we have? Hopefully you guys have been asking them all through. Use this bad boy to come up with, you know, think about the money situation, how you relate to it, all that good stuff. And um, Jay, how will we get them the survey so they can get the five dollar possible five dollars? Are we doing that for this? We are, right? Yes, and it is on the event, and this PowerPoint will also. Ooh, wait, yes. Yes. <laughs> so you get, I was going to say, anyone wants a PowerPoint, you could ask me or Jay says they'll have it. That's cool. Um, my email address is at the beginning, I think. Yeah, yeah. Somewhere. <laughs> uh, info. Yeah. So ask me any questions you have about this presentation. I'll be glad to work with you and answer questions. And, um, Again, the, yeah, so fill out the survey. One person in this room will win a $5 gift card, and then everyone that goes to any session over these three days is eligible for a $50 gift card. So free money. Thanks, guys. Any other questions? I'm here for a while if anyone wants to talk.